So welcome to all of you who joined this morning. Um, yes, this, um, this time it's a bit different in terms of time we're meeting in the morning because we've got a guest from Australia who's uh, nice enough to present on a holiday flu and at 6 p.m. for her. So definitely uh, that's the, the smallest thing we could do. So thank you for joining us uh, on this new session of the Urban Model Seminar. So you might uh, know us now, but I'm Clementine and Ruta uh, is here as well as a host uh, of this seminar. We're happy to see you again, uh, if it's not the first time, or to see you um, for the first time to discuss analytical urban models and their circulation. So once a month for about a year now, we've received an expert of urban studies and modeling to dissect and discuss one model with a general question in mind. And this question is the same every time. The question is, what are the unforeseen consequences of urban model simplifications on our understanding of cities? So we consider urban models as simplifications of reality, but we're interested in these simplifications as reflections of modeling choices, whether they're implicit or explicit. And we try to analyze the consequences that they've had on how we view how we analyze, how we represent and act on cities. So we try to track the discrepancies between model results and empirical analysis back to the model's simplifications, assumptions, and design choices with the aim of providing guidance on how to use classical urban models appropriately, how to avoid misleading conclusions, and ultimately to create better models for cities. Last month, we heard Mike Batty talk about the unforeseen consequences of Forrester's urban dynamics model. The recording is now available on our YouTube channel, Urban Model Seminar. Uh, you can visit it if you're interested. You've got uh, all the previous episodes. And um, if you were interested in this Forrester urban dynamics model on our Twitter account, you can also find new videos and a BBC podcast because it's the 30 years of the Meadows report and the Club of Rome. So uh, some participants recommended some videos and um, podcasts. So they're all on our Twitter account. But today, uh, I'm very happy to introduce Somrita Sarkar to talk about utilitarian models and urban resource allocation. So this will be the, the topic of today. And Somrita is an urban science researcher studying spatial and socioeconomic inequalities in cities. Her work informs urban planning and policy by employing methods from spatial data science and modeling, geography, economics, physics, and complex system science. She leads the Urban Science Lab and is a member of the Transport Lab, Urban Housing Lab, Smart Urbanism Lab, and the Center for Complex Systems at the University of Sydney in Australia. She serves on the editorial board of Environment and Planning B, and is the editor for Urban Findings. She joins us today, as I said, with the flu uh, on, a, on a bank holiday in Australia and at a quite late time in the day, in the working day. So I really want to extend my thanks like more than, uh, more than usual because uh, we really appreciate that you're here. And uh, she's gonna present um, utilitarian model assumptions and their impact on how resource allocation is approached in urban studies and planning. So she will be reflecting on the philosophical underpinnings of utility and its mathematical formalism, and also discuss the consequences of its circulation on the consideration of space in urban models and the relationship between policy recommendations and social spatial inequality. I'm very pleased to hand over to uh, Sam right now. Uh, she will talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll open the floor for questions, uh, just like any other time please uh, write your question during uh, the talk, if you have any. Uh, Samrita doesn't mind answering them during our talk or at the end of the talk, but please write them in a chat and Ruta will invite you to either um, ask the question yourself or she can ask it for you. So I think without further ado, I really want to thank again uh, multiple times Samrita and hand over to you for this 40-ish minute presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Clementine. Uh, at the outset, I must uh, apologize. I think I'll have quite a hoarse voice as you can imagine. I can only uh, anticipate that the excitement of the talk will be enough not to let 
you know a cuff uh episode come in but uh, yeah it's it's flu season in sydney it's also the queen's birthday long weekend and <laughs> but but um but having said that um i want to extend a thanks to clementine and ruta because i thought this whole idea was so exciting and so interesting because we often go down as urban scientists deep into our work and we work with models and numbers and we are churning things and results all the time and there's very little space i think that we take in our lives to really reflect critically upon the work that we are doing and so i think when clementine um first spoke about this idea i was really excited about it and um and and today what i'm going to talk about is not a whole bunch of results um not a whole bunch of models yes a whole bunch of models but reflecting upon them in a very different way and trying to you know explore some of those unforeseen consequences you know that we just carry as assumptions and maybe they become prejudices and biases and things that affect our work but this is a good moment to kind of reflect on those <clears throat> so i'm going to uh try and share my screen i hope my screen is visible now yeah and i may also minimize this window Actually, it's fine. Yeah, okay. So I'm just going to jump right in and say that I've been uh, working on a book for some time now. And obviously the book is on um, scaling theory, but looking at socioeconomic and urban inequalities through the lens of scaling theory. And I thought it would be very interesting. I was looking through all of the work done, especially in economics, and two things jumped out right in front. One, economics as a discipline has formally studied inequalities very, very deeply. So economic inequalities and social inequalities. But at the same time, the way economics has studied inequalities is very aspatial, it's very non-spatial. So geography has not played typically a very big role. And so if I look at a typical income distribution, I could analyze, you know, how much inequality there is, say, in that income distribution. But it is completely blind, that analysis, to the fact that, you know, um, geography really changes how inequalities are distributed. So one of the topics that I was exploring in the book was this whole idea of utilitarianism, because this idea of utility seems to be underpinning a very, very, very large number of optimization models, urban models, economic models, resource allocation models, all of, you know, uh, policy, cost-benefit analysis, so not only academic literature, but also um, policy and practice. And so I thought it would be interesting to explore some of the consequences. So, so I just wanted to start by saying that, you know, when we look, when we think of urban models, we usually think of them as uh, positive or objective. So we are describing the state of a system. Uh, we are trying to simplify it because those are the modeling assumptions. But in essence, we are trying to describe the world as is. So if I say that, you know, it's 25 degrees Celsius, the 25 degrees Celsius is a positive objective measurement. So if I take a thermometer and say that it's 25 degrees, it is 25 degrees. But when we think of it normatively, we are actually attaching a value judgment to it, right? So this guy is saying that when it is high 20s in England, you know, it's really hot, but that compares to 35 degrees Celsius in Sydney. And what that says is that the same 25 degrees normatively could be very hot somewhere, but it could be relatively mild or pleasant somewhere else because we are actually attaching some kind of experiential, subjective, 
value judgment to it. And why this is important is because when we come to policy formation, um, <clears throat> while urban modeling has a scientific focus, urban policy and urban planning have a normative focus because we are planning for people and the policy that we have would actually go and affect different people in different ways, right? So here is an XKCD comic. Um, I thought it was kind of summing up the situation very nicely that it's saying how standards proliferate. Um, in the beginning, there are 14 competing standards and then somebody says, oh, forget about all this normative thing. We should be really objective. We need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases and everyone's agreeing. And then in the end, we are ending up with 15 competing standards instead of 14 because, you know, guess what? The moment we come out with one more standard, you know, one other group in society would come up and say, negative external externalities, positive externalities. This is affecting us in these sort of unexpected ways, right? So, so I think we really need to start to think about urban models, being conscious of the normative basis in urban modeling, which we usually tend not to do. And so when I'm looking at a positive objective worldview, I'm simply interested in describing. So something is, something is not, by how much, in what ways. A system is segregated, a system is not segregated, it is integrated. Um, with 20% probability, I'm going to choose a neighbor similar to myself. Um, in what ways do clusters of segregation then emerge? I'm simply describing a system, but when I go to the normative end, I'm actually questioning, is this much segregation good or is it bad? Is it all right if my city is this much segregated or is it bad? Uh, who is it affecting? Who is getting affected? In what ways are we getting affected, right? So another uh, very nice example I often think of is um, affordable housing. We often say, if I'm in the bottom 40% of the income uh, uh, you know, of the income bracket, and I'm paying more than 30% of my income into towards rent, then I'm in housing stress, right? That's our standard definition for Australia. I think it derives from Canada and UK to some extent. But once I fix those numbers, normatively, I'm actually saying that, you know, objectively, I've said, okay, bottom 40%, 30 percent of my income goes towards rent, I'm under stress, I'm under affordability pressure. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what if it's 29%? What if it's 31%, right? If I'm in the bottom 40% and I'm paying 29.5% of my income, am I not under stress, right? So it's all this, this you know, this value judgment that that comes in as the normative focus. And I think it's it's really important to reflect on this. So why is this also very, very important is because, uh, you know, we we saw my Professor Batty's talk uh, last month and, and his book on inventing future cities really says this one main point that because it is such a wicked problem, because the future is, so complex and there are so many variables interacting and there is literally so much happening and things are changing really fast in the world, we cannot really predict future cities, but we can invent them. And if you're talking about inventing cities, then I think a critical question is that who are we inventing cities for? What are we inventing cities for, right? So urban modeling is at its very heart a normative activity, even when our tools, techniques, and ways of working are quite positive objective. So we cannot es escape the question of who we are building a city for, what we are building a city for. And if we just go and reflect on some of our planning, uh, you know, documents in any country around the world, uh, we see that 
very normative criteria are actually set out as planning goals. So, you know, we want a more livable city, we want a more sustainable city, we want a more equitable city. And so in that sense, you know, again, we are thinking of urban modeling. Well, the hope is that if we do good, positive, objective descriptions, it will assist with better normative decision making. That is our hope. So let's jump into this. I mean, that was this huge background because I really wanted to sort of make this distinction between the positive and the normative clear uh, because, because what we are going to discuss is going to, in, in, in the idea of utility, these two concepts are going to interact in very strange and very unexpected ways, right? Where in essence, we are going to see that it fails what's it, what it sets out to achieve. So it says, this is what I want to achieve, but exactly applying the positive principles mathematically or in terms of pragmatic you know, practice, exactly the opposite consequence occurs in some sense. So that's what was very interesting to me when I was you know, going through the whole literature. Um, so we start at, you know, 1789 when Jeremy Bentham writes his book, An Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation. And he is defining utility as that property in any object whereby it tends to produce pleasure, good or happiness or to prevent the happening of mischief, pain, evil, or unhappiness to the party whose interest is considered. Essentially, so I'm maximizing happiness to some extent, and that is utility. And that property is defined as utility. That property which maximizes happiness is defined as utility. Um, if we go to an objective interpretation. So how does this sort of rather vague principle translate into a mathematical formalism? Um, typically in all of law planning, legislation, economics, it is translated as the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So if the net aggregate utility is maximized, if utility is maximized in the aggregate for the largest number of people in society, that means we are satisfying the principles of utility maximization. And that ensures that we will bring the greatest happiness to the greatest number. So it is morally, normatively justifiable in that sense, right? So every single optimization model will maximize aggregate utility. Not only that, um, you know, I'm going to walk through like one particular example in detail, but then discuss many other models in which it reflects in, you know, very different sort of ways. And so when we're talking about this principle of maximizing aggregate utility, um, let's look at one classic uh, model. And I have to say that this principle of utility uh, or maximizing utility has very, very wide ranging impacts on all kinds of urban models. But, uh, you know, this is the most classic, right? So, so this is our monocentric model. And um, I have to remind myself that, you know, the podcast <laughs> so, so because it's so easy to shift to the video and think that the screen is available. So, so we are looking at the monocentric model and the monocentric model is really simple. Um, I think there was one session earlier in the series where we also in details discuss, looked at the monocentric model, but essentially we have the city in the center and it is in the um, it is situated on like a featureless plane and land uses essentially organize in concentric circles around the city. And 
the reason they organize in concentric circles is because this is a trade-off between transport costs, selling prices of products, production costs, and land rents, right? So in simple terms, if you were close to the city center, la land rents would be higher, but transport costs would be lower because the city center serves as the place where all economic activity is happening. So a precursor of the monocentric city model was Juan Thunin's agricultural land users model where the village town, like the market center in the village was also where a lot of crops were being sold and traded and a lot of you know agricultural products were being sold and traded. And so the idea was that if you're living, if, if you need land that is just right enough, but you can afford to be close to the city, you locate right around the city center, but say if you are growing wheat or you know, you're growing crops that need large amounts of land, then you have to locate much farther away from the center. But as you grow farther away from the center, your land rents fall and your um, <clears throat> transport costs increase. So it's a trade-off between transport costs and land rents, essentially. And transport increases with increasing distance from center while rents or gains from farming decrease with increasing distance from center. So this kind of led to a mathematical model. And again, we can see that very simple models can arise out of these trade-offs. I won't really spend a huge amount of time. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that you know my locational rent is decided by yield per unit area, market price multiplied by market price minus my production cost. And I subtract um, the yield per unit area times the distance from the market times the transport cost per unit in some sense. So it's it's this trade-off and what and, and that trade-off gives me the locational rent at a particular point. And this is essentially the reason why um, things organize in concentric circles. So this led to the classic Alonso Muth Mills model in 1964. And the idea was very, very similar to the Von Thunen model. Uh, we had a city with a CBD in the center, population residing around it, and everybody, the assumption is everybody commutes to work in the CBD or the central business district. Again, transport costs increase with increasing distance from the CBD. And so households choose to locate as close as possible to the CBD. Uh, but since everyone wants to be as close as possible, rents are higher, closer to the CBD because there's more competition. And obviously densities are higher, housing space is lower, and then rents and density uh, sort of adjust accordingly. But here comes the critical utility maximization argument. It is assumed that all households maximize their utilities with the income or budget as a constraint, right? So this is, here is utility maximization in action. And the households have a choice of living either close to the city or farther away. If they live close to the city, they have smaller dwellings. If they live farther away, they have larger dwellings. If they live close to the city, they pay less in transport costs. If they live farther away from the city, they pay more in transport costs, right? So if I want to maximize my utility, I will think if I am a family, I might need more space. Therefore, I will choose to pay more transport costs and locate farther away from the center. But if I'm a single person and I want to be close to the downtown and I want to be close to my office, and I don't mind living in a smaller apartment and you know, paying higher rents, then I would choose to you know, live closer to the city. But in both cases, I'm maximizing my utility. I'm maximizing my happiness or my pleasure. And my choice is based on you know, maximizing what I want out of this trade-off. So in that way, if everyone has the same income, then we have what's called a Pareto optimal front. We choose with a given income, either to live closer to the CBD 
or to live farther away from the CBD. And that led to the classic monocentric urban model. And <clears throat> this is really the classic picture of a big city. So if I just imagine the skyline of Manhattan or Sydney, I, I just automatically can see these very tall buildings. Almost, It's almost like a big city skyline is an information visualization of this utility maximization happening in principle, right? Because the, the density and the height of the buildings kind of captures the, the idea of high rents and high density around the city center. And as we move away from the city center, we can sort of see this gradient and the building heights decrease, the densities decrease, everything decreases. And while I'm, when I'm out in the suburbs, you know, everything's very flat, detached housing, low density housing, and so on and so forth. So, so it's almost like a physical information visualization of this optimization model in some sense. So um, here is that Pareto optimal front. Um, it, it won't, I think, show in the podcast, but what we have is um, an X and Y axis in which um, an X, X axis is essentially the amount of space I have for my housing and Y axis is essentially everything else um, left over. So I, I, I'm trading off a composite good in which everything else is there and you know recreation, leisure, transport, all of that included versus my, um, the amount I'm allocating to housing. And I will see these sort of fronts, Pareto optimal fronts for given incomes. And I will try and locate on somewhere on this front where I'm maximizing my utility as a single household, right? As a single, either as a person, single person household or as a multiple person household. So this actually is very interesting because it has also been confirmed with a lot of empirical data. So this is a Reserve Bank of Australia paper, for example, where they actually tracked, um, you know, how housing prices decrease as you move away from the city center, dwelling sizes increase, building heights decrease, densities decrease, price of land decreases, and populations kind of decrease, but, you know, saturates and, uh, you know, by the time you're reaching the city limit, you'll have decreasing population density. And at some point, the city ends and you're into the rural area. So, so it's just not an idea. We can actually see it in practice and a lot of empirical data confirms it. So that was really just an example of how, uh, like a detailed description of how the mathematics of utility maximization forms a very intricate part of the monocentric city model, the polycentric city model later. Uh, but uh, we might think, yeah, well, that's the most classic urban economic model, right? That's 101 urban economics. So maybe that's the only place where we can witness utility maximization. But that's not true because if we look at many other different types of models, they come into play in uh, the idea of utility maximization really comes into play in, in a variety of ways. So for example, let's look at the shelling model. That's the classic segregation model. Again, it was discussed a couple of episodes earlier, um, a whole episode on shelling models, so uh, on the shelling model. So uh, now the shelling model kind of, the basic assumption is, Utility is for a single person is maximized through having similar neighbors with a certain given probability, right? So I maximize my happiness or my utility if I don't mind, if I have eight neighbors surrounding me on a grid, then only if one of them or two of them were similar to me in my perception of what is similar, then I'm maximizing my utility. And given this rule, then I'm switching places on the grid. And the unforeseen consequence 
is that everybody is maximizing their utility, but we are ending up with segregation. And as Schelling showed, that even with an extremely low probability of this preference, the system will, and a fully integrated system will end up as a fully clustered, fully segregated system, right? So in essence, we are at a paradox here because each person maximizing their own utility does not lead to the system maximizing its utility. And I think that's fairly, that's fairly um, well established that collective utility may not be maximized if individual utilities are maximized. But at the same time, we'll see just a little bit later that the whole idea in utility maximization is based on summing up the individual utilities to look at then collective measures of utility, right? So, okay. So then the other model that's very interesting to talk about is this uh, network preferential attachment models. And we've seen these, especially if we work with the network science literature in which we are looking at complex networks and complex networks of nodes and links. So if we think of say Facebook or you know any kind of a social network, uh, we know that uh, all the people are nodes and links between them could be friendship links, follow links, any sort of a social interaction link or economic interaction link, right? So the idea in prefer preferential attachment models is, excuse me, is that suppose I'm a new node and I have no links in the system. I am a new migrant coming into a city. I am a new node entering an established social network. I will maximize my utility if I go and attach myself to the best known person or to the best attached person. So the most link rich person in the network, right? Because that then the probability that I get connected to others in the system is the fastest. Because if I attach myself in some sense to the best you know, connected person network. So what is the unforeseen consequence is that the rich get richer because link poor new nodes in the network try and attach to link rich nodes to maximize their utility. But as a consequence of this process, the rich nodes keep getting even richer and richer and richer, right? And exactly the same idea comes into play if we now move to models of city growth, such as say zip flaw, where um, you know, an older city has an advantage over a younger city because ut utility is maximized via agglomeration economies and economies of scale for when we are talking about uh, say zip flaw and we observe this power law relationship uh, that there's a the largest city in a system and the second largest city is kind of half the size of the large city and then the third city is one third the size of the largest city and that's that's what's predicted by zip flaw so the nth city in the system is one nth the size of the largest city right so if i'm an old city in the system um, I have an advantage given my economies of scale and agglomeration economies and positive returns to scale, I will tend to grow more and more and more. And it's extremely, so let's just say in, in, in uh, pragmatic terms, it's very, very unrealistic to expect that the New Yorks and Londons and Sydneys and Parises of the world would die. Like they've been there forever and they'll probably continue to be there just because of the fact that, you know, New York, so, et cetera. So, so if I'm a large city, then I have an advantage. And all this is happening in essence because of the same idea of uh, what I was earlier talking about in terms of network preferential attachment models that link rich nodes attract more and more and more um, just because they are big, right? Okay, and that then if we generalize it even further, that then applies to any sort of power law or positive feedback based model because aggregate utility is maximized by maximizing the utility of elements or components 
that are already large or rich or more wealthy in the system. So the almost hidden normative assumption here is that systems maximize greatest happiness for the greatest number when we are maximizing utility in the aggregate, right? So that's the kind of normative assumption and that reflects in a lot of our um, objective positive urban models. So another final example, uh, we think of scaling laws in cities. And here again, what I was just talking about a little bit earlier that larger cities, we, we sort of see that larger cities are more innovative, more diverse, more productive, more wealthy. And, and that is a consequence of this sort of scaling because if on the x-axis I have population and say the y-axis I have any urban indicator that I'm measuring about the city, I usually notice that um, if it's an input into the city system, right? If it's an investment uh, into maintaining the city, so if I measure the length of road networks, if I measure the number of petrol pumps, if I measure the number of cinemas or theaters or you know, any, any resource that goes in to maintain a city, that always shows a rate of growth that is sublinear or lower than proportional to the rate of growth of the population, right? So it's still growing, but it's growing at a rate lower than one is to one. Right, so if I have a city of a hundred people and I'm investing a dollar to provide infrastructure for these people, by the time I reach a city of 200 people, maybe I only need to spend 90 more dollars or 85 more dollars, not a hundred extra dollars, right? But when I look at system outputs, when I look at um, you know economic outputs, so not inputs, but outputs from the system, so total income, total ex, um, you know, number of patents, total wealth, total GDP, any, any measure of economic output, that tends to grow super linearly, right? So if I have a city of 100 people, everyone earns a dollar, but by the time I'm reaching a city of 200 people, the total wealth is probably 215 or 220, not just 200. So it's not linear rate of growth, it's higher rate of growth. So if I'm now thinking, oh, economic inputs are sublinear, economic outputs are superlinear. So as my city size grows, the distance between inputs and outputs keeps kind of growing. So if I look here on my uh, you know, distance, the larger the city, the larger the gap, according to this model, the larger the gap between inputs going into the city and outputs coming out of the city, right? So that's the whole scaling idea. And that kind of sort of supports this um, whole idea of uh, what I was just talking about previously about preferential attachment models, zip flow, um, you know, any kind of positive feedback based model where economies of scale are being combined with, um, increasing returns to scale, right? And, and all of this is somehow, it keeps coming back to the idea that we are maximizing an aggregate utility function for the whole system. So with that final example, um, those were examples of urban models. Let's also look at some examples of uh, practice, policy and practice. And so we all know that uh, any big planning project has to go through social, environmental, economic impact assessments. And a very, very commonly done tool, in fact, the most common tool of how an impact assessment is carried out is this cost-benefit analysis. And so cost-benefit analysis um, I thought I'll pull up an actual policy document 
which is why everything I've put up there is actually in italics because uh, underneath I have the link here for the New South Wales government's um, instructions, set of guidelines on how exactly an impact assessment and a cost benefit analysis is carried out. And so they define a cost benefit analysis as an appraisal and evaluation technique that estimates the economic, social, and environmental costs and benefits of a project or program in monetary terms, right? Um, what is key here is again, this idea of aggregate utility maximization because maximizing net benefits is termed as a key indicator. So overall, a CBA reports whether the benefits of a proposal are likely to exceed the costs and which option among a range of options will result in the highest net social benefit, right? And that's, that's really key because when we are saying highest net social benefit, we are acknowledging that some people are going to win, some people are going to lose, but as long as I'm computing everyone individually and I see a net social benefit, then that's a good idea. We'll pass the plan or we'll pass the proposal, right? What's very key here is there is either none or very little and certainly not mandatory distributional analysis. So there is net benefits are being computed. What is not being computed is how are these benefits being distributed, right? So in fact, it's actually very interesting to see that the document itself mentions that distributional analysis can be included as supplementary information, but it's not essential that it's included. So again, um, the explicit normative assumption here is that plans and policies maximize the greatest happiness for the greatest number, but in doing this analysis, they're not focused on how this greatest happiness is distributed. It's simply computing the total aggregate, right? So with that, like what is the unexpected consequence, right, in detail? And let's just have a think about this, but I'll see if, uh, the, I can't see any questions in the chat. So maybe there are none up to this point, um, but, but so, I mean, if we look at it on the surface, it's very, it's very clear, right? If we are maximizing um, the happiness, the utility for the maximum number of people, that should be good for society, right, as a whole. So what is the unexpected consequence here? And this is where, uh, you know, we begin to reflect a little. And I'll refer to uh, Amartya Sen's analysis from economics from the book actually on economic inequality. There's a really large chapter on utilitarianism. And I picked this as a key reference, but really there's a, there's a big literature on critiquing utilitarianism within economics. I also just think that it's very important that we bring in this sort of ideas into urban modeling and into urban planning so that we are explicitly thinking on these issues from a spatial perspective and not just an economic perspective. So, okay, so the assumption in utility models is that every person's utility is the same. And so total aggregate utility is simply the sum of individual utilities. So this is, this is the, that assumption which we saw reflected in all of those earlier models. But as we saw that it had very, strange consequences that every person in the shelling model maximized their individual utilities, but as a result, total aggregate utility actually went down, right? So similarly, you know, the rich get richer preferential attachment sort of models. So this is really interesting that this is how it's mathematically defined in all of the optimization models. Um, one thing to consider here, is that if we leave the total utility of a system unchanged, but actually transfer money from the poor person to the rich person in the system, the overall utility still remains unchanged. 
right? So because this is the sum of individual utilities, if I do a plus somewhere and I do a minus somewhere, but I leave this total unchanged, then nothing changes. You know, I still have the exactly the same of, you know, objective function, which is maximizing exactly the same utility. And yet I have, I could end up with a more unequal system and it won't even register on this model, right? So utilitarianism is essentially blind to distributions of the aggregate. So that's one pretty large unforeseen consequence. And it kind of also goes back to explain uh, if we could keep going back to our examples of, you know, the monocentric model, the shelling model, the, you know, all of those sort of, which is exactly why if we look at some of, you know, David Harvey's books, Social Justice and the City, and he's describing um, exactly how American cities had movements of the poor and rich people, um, you know, when automobiles happened and when the industrial revolution happened and the form that cities took. And, you know, it's essentially the idea that um, aggregate utilities probably stayed the same. So the optimization function was working fine, but the rich had a lot more choice than the poor to exercise their choice on distributions, right? So, and, and the poor had very little choice and therefore, you know, you have spatial consequences which are obviously very bad for the poor and very good for the rich in some sense. Okay, and now another unforeseen consequence. We consider a situation where aggregate utility goes up when income is transferred from a poorer person to a richer person. So not only the first point is a weaker one. If I leave this total unchanged and I do a plus X1 and a minus X1, they cancel out leaving this total unchanged, right? So from here, we now move to this situation, strangely enough, which was the bit that was really surprising for me was the fact that this can actually go up. Total aggregate utility can actually go up if the utility that a richer person derives from X amount of dollars is higher than the utility that a poorer person derives from the same X amount of dollars, right? And let me, let me just... Uh, summarize that by saying that aggregate utility is higher for a more unequal system, right? So let's just, let's just take this abstract discussion to actually demonstrating it, right? So let's just replace economic analysis with spatial analysis when thinking about resource allocations. And let's just adapt uh, this is this is Amartya Sen's analysis from economics, but I've simply adapted it to sort of a utility analysis for areas in the city, right? And we now imagine that we have two areas in the city, A and B. And initially, if they are sort of the same area, so we so so we consider no difference. They are both at equal level of affluence equal levels of, uh, you know, income, everything is the same, socioeconomic demographic profiles are the same, exactly the same. If I have, in terms of resource allocation, if I have I number of dollars to distribute, what's the most fair distribution? Obviously, I'm going to partition it right through the center and say that I'm going to give exactly half the income to area A, and I'm going to give exactly half the income to area B. So area A derives utility small a, area B derives utility small b, so that this trapezium here, so A I prime I A, uh, maybe this slide can be uploaded later, but you know you can actually pictorially see quite clearly that a clear half and half distribution of income results in exactly the same amounts of utility increase to both areas A and B, right? Because this is because essentially, um, let's just imagine that this 
is a new train line being laid down, right? So if areas A and B had exactly similar car ownership ratios and similar number of employed people going into work, then if I invest X amount of dollars into both area A and B, exactly the same number would say shift from car ownership to taking the public transit, right? So the utilities for both areas are the same, but now consider a situation where area A is much, much more affluent than area B, right? So area A has much, many, much more, um, you know, higher levels of income, well connected, already principally well connected to the city, um, skilled workforce, high car ownership, you know, all the, all the demographics that you can imagine for affluent areas, just imagine that. Whereas area B, imagine area B as historically being poor, a low car ownership rates, low employment rates, low skill rates, right? So now what happens is if a train line, if, if an income allocation is made, the justification is that more money should be given to area A because more number of people will shift from car to the public transit because more number of employed people live there because car ownership rates. So you'll be able to measure that transition more effectively. But the unforeseen consequence it has is that, you know, so, so basically from the same income, area A is deriving higher utility and from the same income, area B is now deriving a lower utility B1 because it is because of that spatial trajectory, because of its history, because it can't use the same number of dollars to the same advantage as a more affluent area, right? And in, in this case, what's surprising is that utility maximization principles would actually shift this front from the left to the right, allocating even more income to area A and even lesser income to area B. Because aggregate utilities are actually reducing if we do an equal income you know, allocation. But aggregate utility for the entire system actually rises if we allocate more money to the richer areas in the city, right? And that kind of just blew me away because it was this one moment of, you know, we need to, we need to sort of relook in terms of what we are doing in terms of just assuming we, that there's so many assumptions that we have and we never question them. And this was a, this was a kind of a nice moment for me, like a nice aha moment for me, right? So I'm going to go back there and say that total aggregate utility is increasing for a more unequal system. So we are rewarding more and more unequal systems because in our measurement models, we are rewarding inequality because our aggregate utility measure, the maximization of our objective function is higher for a more unequal system. That's, that's the unforeseen consequence. And so here is a, a really neat example. This is the Metro, the new Metro rail that is proposed for Sydney. And traditionally for Sydney, um, the North and the East are very well off and the South and the West are relatively lesser well off, right? And there is actually this whole, uh, some of our geography students did this very interesting idea. They did a smashed avocado index of inequality. They went around um, surveying all the restaurant menus in the city and they, first of all, they checked whether the restaurant offers smashed avocado on toast. And if it does, what is the price for it? And so both the number of restaurants offering this menu item was um, much more in the North and the East. And also the pricing 
went from as low as I think nine or ten dollars per plate towards the south and the west to something like as high as eighteen or nineteen dollars, you know, towards the north and the east. So there's also this concept of a latte line, which kind of fake <laughs> me, but but it's it's not really a joke. It's not popularity based um, th uh, assumptions. If you take any kind of socioeconomic demographic data, so on the left, we have a map and it actually shows real unemployment rates by statistical areas level one from the 2016 census all across for Sydney. And you can easily see that the South and the West is much more red and orange than the North and the East. And on the right, we see the resource allocation example where new metro train lines were proposed and the north and the west uh, sort of won because that's where the highest con uh, uh, concentration of highly skilled workers who travel to Sydney CBD and all the areas around it. So Sydney CBD is right asymmetrically placed at this easternmost corner next to the coast. And so a very, very large amount of skilled jobs are concentrated in the CBD. And it's very, it's not, Sydney is not really polycentric in that sense. It's very, very monocentric still, although the plan is for Sydney to become more polycentric. Uh, and, and so because the North and the West, sort of the North and the East had a lot of a concentration of skilled workers and the concentration towards the CBD of the jobs is the highest, the, that sort of area one and, and the train line is actually allocated that way. Whereas you can easily see on the map that, especially this area like Fairfield, I think it has the highest unemployment rate across Australia. And we have an index of deprivation similar to the UK index of multiple deprivation and you know, in some other countries, we have what is called the CIFA index, the socioeconomic index indices for areas. And it has an index called IRSD, the index of relative socioeconomic deprivation. So once again, uh, all the scores of one, very prominent in this sort of area. And this area, unfortunately, remains one of the most disconnected areas, you know, connecting it to any principal employment center. So it becomes like a vicious cycle, you know, lower rates of unemployment, lower historic connectivity, low affluence rates, low dis high disadvantage rates, even lesser resource allocation. And then it kind of spirals even further down. Right. So it's, it's really, it's, it's really um, something to show that principle from abstract principle happening in action. Um, and yeah, so I guess the unexpected consequence is that maximizing aggregate utilities or happiness is actually ending up increasing segregation, increasing inequalities, and increasing maldistributions, bad distributions. And so should we consciously be rethinking some of the normative basis of urban models and what we are you know, studying for, should we develop new indicators which actually focus on distribution and measurement of distributional inequalities? Um, should we actually rethink? So look, look at distributions as we are also looking at aggregate optimizations, right? So look at sort of aggregate as well as distributional analysis. And also should we philosophically look more into, you know, these sort of paradoxical assumptions and unexpected results that happen. And, and so for example, in economics, uh, this is all old stuff. Any economist here would tell me, yeah, you didn't tell me anything new. This has been known since whatever, you know, uh, a long time. But, but then, you know, in economics, there were very steady advances made. So utilitarianism was compared against libertarianism, which is you know, completely different, but um, 
<coughs> informs a lot of the politics in a lot of countries. But, uh, but then, you know, looking at John Rawls' theory of justice, which arose as a critique of utilitarianism, and then Amartya Sen's capability theories, which then arose as a critique of John Rawls' theory of justice. So, so there's a big sort of chain of analysis, and I've only sort of captured the first bit or the most, uh, you know, the heart of it. And, and I guess I think I'm going to stop here. And I hope I'm doing okay for time. Yes, yep. it's absolutely perfect on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a very nice presentation with a lot of links to other theories and theoretical approaches, including those that we already had in our seminars. So thank you very much for making these links. Um, and also, as you mentioned in the beginning, it is very important to, um, from time to time to remind ourselves of this broader picture. So it's really well done. <laughs> Thanks again. Um, and actually, I, while you were talking, I wrote down uh, several questions, but later you answered them all. So I'm a bit confused at the moment. But um, it was very interesting um, to, to hear. Uh, also expected that segregation is unforeseen consequence, which um, uh, in, in, in the beginning I thought that it's exactly the kind of aim of this approach to reduce segregation, but it's the opposite. Um, yeah, but um, what, what does it mean? Um, yeah, what it means, uh, uh, well, how to formulate it, uh, to, to design the city in an utilitarian way. So what would be the main principles then? And I hear a lot that it's about money, about these uh, benefits in terms of money or distribution of money, but maybe there are also something about uh, in terms of infrastructure, schools, hospitals, or something like this. So what would be the utilitarian approach and how would it be applied in urbanism? Yeah, so I think I, I think it already is. I think it is sort of the basis which is already applied to a large extent. And, and that, that's why I was quoting from the plan there, uh, the, the idea of uh, you know, how cost benefit analysis, uh, environment impact assessments, social impact assessments, all of those things which are currently done in practice today are actually very, very influenced by this whole idea that we will compute the costs to everybody and we will compute the benefits to everybody. And then we just have to ensure that when I sum up the costs column and I sum up the benefits column, the benefits should outweigh the costs. But there is very little, so that is literally the application of the utilitarian principle, right? But what is not analyzed is how are these, this, how is this cost column distributed? Who is bearing the cost? And how is this benefits column distributed? Who is bearing the benefits? Right, so I, I, I think so that's, that's the extra bit which should come in, right? So if you, if you talk to philosophers, like they come out with all of these really strange um, idea experiments, thought experiments. And, and one of these is this typical um, sort of, I don't know where I watched it or read it, but there's this idea that if I'm completely healthy and I go to a doctor for my visit, and at the same time, visiting a doctor are five perfect matches, five people who need five organs, right? So somebody needs a heart, somebody needs a lung, somebody needs something, something, something. So, so if you kill a perfectly healthy person and give five organs to five people, five lives are saved, but, but is killing the one person to save five people. So it's really, it's, it's really, but, and you might say, oh, that's just a thought experiment. 
But then the researcher pointed out that, uh, you know, uh, there was this case of syphilis or some disease spreading through a population and they deliberately withholded um, medication because they wanted to study how, what, what are the consequences the disease has on the population? Exactly how does the disease kill? Because that was the justification for developing medication. But this disease was mostly affecting minority populations. And so for many years, they actually kept conducting this social experiment, giving them placebos and not giving them, you know, the best known medication for the time, justifying it that, you know, for the greater good. Because a few years down the line, they actually developed the medication. And then this was justified by saying that, oh, okay, these many people died, but as a result, we could, you know, eradicate this disease or we could successfully. So these are like these deeply philosophical questions which have been around in social policy for a long time. And this is like classic utilitarianism in action. And I think it, but, but in, in the urban space, it keeps happening, but we don't, I don't see a lot of active questioning on it, right? So if, if I have like a big, investment obviously who gets it sydney gets it why because it's the biggest city but should we in instead think of you know medium sized towns or smaller towns you know who would get the same chunk of money and be able to grow their economies better and you know a big city not acting as this sort of sucking force that sucks the resources out of all the hinterland in, in, in growing, right? So, so there's all this, these ideas of scale come in that should we keep supporting because, just because it's maximizing overall utility, should we keep investing in the bigger and the bigger and the bigger nodes? Or should there be a distributional idea which kind of informs how we should think about the smaller nodes in the system? Yeah, I don't know whether I've answered your question. No, no. But it was very interesting, yeah, and raised the, for me ideas how to experiment on cities in this way, like, you know, to increase segregation somewhere and see what happens. <laughs> uh, Clementine, maybe you have a question. Yes, thank you, Samrita. I had a, a sort of question for you, and it's continuing on, the, on this philosophical questions, because you can definitely question the distributional aspect and I think it's, it's really interesting I haven't read much about the spatial distribution aspect of uh, those consequences that you're mentioning <laughs> but I guess we could even go further in this questioning because utility in itself is basically this measure of what cannot be measured I mean it, it's I remembered my first economics classes and being like okay so there's value there's a, like the value for yourself and the exchange value and like the value for yourself is something you can't measure. So we've invented something that we can measure it. Actually, we, we sum it up, we multiply it, we divide it, we can make it a ma mathematical tool. But when you go back to this first, like, okay, this is the measure of happiness of what, what it does for you, this service, this fraction of a service, it really questions a lot. Um, it takes a lot to admit this concept and then from going to okay we're going to measure it but then sum it up and divide it and it, it's quite strange and then found all of our models on this and on maximization of this measure that we can't really trust because it measures the unmeasurable what do you think would models based on another concept uh, like maybe the capabilities or things that are ordered rather than absolute values for example what do you think it would look like and do you think we would arrive at the sort of same conclusions because I, I found it really interesting that you you presented the monocentric model for example that's really derived from this utility maximization and say like well in most cities it looks like this so it's probably right do you think we would find similar models and similar conclusions with models based on a more maybe reasonable ways of measuring expectations, what people want, what makes them happy, what they pursue as goals. So it's a very mm. long, complicated questions. <laughs> no, and, and you're absolutely right, because what if, what if we changed 
um, you know, we measure everything by money and economic profit. But what if, what if you were measuring, I don't know, the first, the first thought that came to my mind was accessibility. So instead of utility, what if we were maximizing accessibility for everybody in the system? And it's an interesting experiment. Like, I don't know what's, maybe it'll just turn up to be exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> because, because if we are looking at a huge number of jobs concentrated in the CBD, then obviously, you know, all places that increase accessibility would be, I don't know, I don't know. I think I, think I can't answer that question, but, but I, I definitely think that instead of having utility maximization as the only argument in models, one could start to look at, uh, so one, one thing that really I think is interesting is that the same dollar has a different value for each one of us and utility maximization doesn't consider that. So utility maximization kind of says a dollar is the same for you as it is for me, as you know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. So if I get a dollar, you get a dollar, doesn't matter. But maybe, you know, what if, what if um, I have a very small child and therefore I, my need for the dollar may be more than, you know, if I don't have that child or maybe if I am 80 years old versus 20 years old, then a dollar is not the same for me. Or maybe if I'm disabled in some way or, you know, challenged in some other ways or, so, so, so my particular situation in life decides what this utility value is. So variable utilities, right? right? So it's not that, you know, here is a bit of money and we derive the same utility from it. I think the collapsing of the amount of money being equal to the amount of utilities where the fault is because the acknowledgement of the fact that each of us derive different utilities out of different resources is, is very critical, I think. And if we start to build that into our models, then we, we might actually normatively design or invent very different kinds of spatial distributions. Yeah, I haven't answered your question, but. No, I guess so, well, there was a, hard to answer uh, as a question, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm curious, do you know any urban modeler who has started to tackle this question by like changing classical models to maximize other quantities or other? Not that I have come across. Okay. Not that I have come across. I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge, I think people, again, again, just as normatively like, um, we have unconsciously we don't question some of the bases but also unconsciously we are motivated by these you know goals right livability sustainability equity so so of course there's a huge literature in say segregation that is actively normatively saying segregated cities are bad right so so uh so there's there's this equality of opportunity project at harvard which traced longitudinal data on people moving neighborhoods over 30 40 years of their lives and and it actually showed that moving into more mixed neighborhoods intergenerationally raised income levels raised skill levels raised quality of life levels for whoever moved and whoever did not move suffered a poorer consequence in life 30 years later or 40 years later. So, so I, think, I think there is a lot of, obviously like, you know, everybody who's working in this whole space of inequality in whatever way, whether in economics or in geography or in urban planning would have thought of that. But I, I just think, you know, how, how cleanly utility maximization models are you know, presented in literature. I think we need something like that. Like we need something which is kind of clean, presented as a very powerful idea, 
as a response to this, which which I haven't seen. Yes, I, I would agree. And I would say we need two things. We need this, but we also need to, well, make it a little bit less clean because it's it's too attractive. Like the solution is already made. Like you use utility, it's going to be easy, it works. But why should it be uh, the solution is uh, is really not answered uh, mm. in my opinion. Mm. Um, do we have any questions from the participants? We're not that many today, so if you want to <coughs> raise a virtual hand and uh, ask your question, it's definitely possible. Yeah, just to add to your discussion, I keep thinking about uh, happiness, like how to maximize happiness <laughs> um, instead of, yeah the money or accessibility as you mentioned because accessibility also depends on age like retired people and they have uh, lower needs or well, maybe happiness could be one one of the choice but difficult to measure okay okay i have clearly either really confused everybody <laughs> <laughs> or made it so clear the <laughs> or made it so clear <laughs> that's right it's one or the other well thank but... you oh sorry no no go ahead no i wanted to uh close but if you have something to say before it uh please um yeah i was saying if even if there are no questions i mean if someone wants to just share their experience or comments or thoughts even that would be even that would be nice but if that you have to remember it's it's, it's the morning in our time zone so maybe uh, <laughs> uh yes hi hi hey i was never hearing a question but it's not that we can show you no, you cannot hear me. You can't hear me? I... Sorry, I can't, we can't hear you very well. Maybe now? No? Uh, we can hear you, but not very well. But uh, we can hear you. <laughs> Maybe now, but uh, not really. Yeah, yeah we, we can hear you. Samrita, can you hear? I can hear, yeah, faintly, but I can hear. Faintly. Okay, wait a minute. Maybe now it's better? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Much, Much better. better. <laughs> No, I was just thinking, you know, how you were showing this curve and how, you know, that gap is increasing and then how you were seeing, uh, talking about the uh, location A and location B. So I was thinking, isn't it also a question of, of scale or, or of, of what scale you're looking at for your interventions? Because, of course, if you look at all Australia and you have all those nodes of all those cities, then Sydney is going to be the center. But uh so i was thinking if you think about this cost benefit analysis it's really the more the scale is really important of, of of where you want to do your interventions because if you for instance think about this last slide you showed and there was the west of sydney and if you only look at that certain couple of neighborhoods then certainly your cost benefit analysis is going to be much more accurate as if you would look at whole sydney so I was just thinking that maybe the first correction of, 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 of what you just uh, uh, raised as a discussion would be to say that cost benefit analysis is, is really dependent on the scale you're doing at it. Isn't it something that, <laughs> that is a little bit of a conclusion or, or a little bit of a, uh, uh, something that I was thinking about maybe that you know, it's in the end of the day, it really comes out down to at which scale you do this. Yeah, although I think I would say that what I was discussing 
is done at all scales. So if it's a choice between Sydney and smaller cities, say Sydney wins, or between London and you know cities around London, London would eventually win. Within London, it's the most well-connected areas. Within Sydney, it's the most, again, the richest would win. And then again, if, if I zoom down again, so I think, I think no matter what scale we look at, it's this idea of aggregate maximization, which keeps coming into play, sort of hierarchy. No, certainly, certainly. I'm just saying that the less the problem, the 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 smaller the scale or, or I don't know yeah <laughs> yeah no but but yeah I mean scale is critically very important for interventions I agree high seraphim <laughs> hi seraphim <laughs> hello hello hi uh, okay since uh, since we have a couple of minutes uh, I mean I really enjoyed your talk it was fantastic and I learned quite a few things there as well um, the the question from Yanka about scale uh, is on the, on the one hand valid. On the other hand, I'm a little bit confused because you're taking the cities as entities. So in a way, you're saying, okay, London. This is what how we define London, whatever. And then you are investigating it, etc. And another city may be smaller or larger, and you take it also as entity. So the scale issue. I'm not sure how it can come into this discussion in a way. So I tend to agree with you, Sobrita, that uh, you know, if you take this, this as entities, if on the other hand, you take them as polycentric models, et cetera, and how you define different parts of the city, then maybe the scale becomes more relevant in this discussion. Um, and we can think about this, but I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, a discussion topic. I also like the comment about maximizing happiness instead of, uh, utility <laughs> um, and it's it is a debate at the moment uh, also in social and human geography but as Ruta said how on earth do you measure happiness at least with utility we have monetary ways of measuring it so it's uh, yeah it's an exciting area of research but I don't know how far it can go but I would like to thank you basically for this amazing presentation and the discussion that followed it's uh, great me too <laughs> And now we have some questions in the chat also. Uh, oh. So, yeah. So, uh, maybe the limitations of segregation models um, are rooted in subjective mental aspects that need tools to be measured. So, preferences think? of people and choice yep. models. So, just mm -hmm. like we have discrete choice models and we have surveys of people you know transport like what will be your mode of transport choice and and then you can build micro discrete choice sort of models out of it um, similarly you know measuring I, I don't know that's a very interesting idea that's what I thought I thought well transport has discrete choice models but um, in the segregation literature there's I haven't come across a model which actually goes and pings people and says, you know, what, yeah. And, and I'm sure there is because there's a huge amount of literature. I'm always amazed at these new papers that, you know, you keep finding, but I don't, I, I haven't come across that idea and it's a very interesting one. I, I often think of this idea, uh, it was done in the US consciously, like there were redlining districts and and in when when segregation was actually part of official policy so there were these red lined districts and on one side of that red line only the um you know essentially the black community would stay segregated schools segregated housing and and on the other side of the line uh and and where you could apply for housing where you could apply for a whole lot of things really dependent on was dependent on those official definitions of the redlining so 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 officially in policy as well there was a lot in segregation so i don't know but but i don't know whether subjective mental aspects have actually been measured and what sort of data that would yield 
Okay. Uh, and I guess the last question and Javier will ask it. Yeah, I wanna try. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for the for the talk. I really enjoyed it. I had a question regarding like, okay, this kind of negative side effects about using utilitarian models and eventually they are actually perpetuating even segregation that we assume that it's a, a bad thing and, um, and actually they are uh, increasing them because the utility function is going up. It's not as well because uh, of having definitions of the utility functions in very in very limited ways. So it would be relatively easy to tackle to integrate in the utilitar into the utilitarian function uh, other factors just for avoiding this kind of like, if we want to avoid precisely uh, segregation and we want to increase uh, diversity, it would be at least feasible to integrate on those utilitarian uh, approaches, diversity and, and, and heterogeneity into districts or into social composition of, of areas of the city or economic activity or whatever factor of diversity that we would like to integrate. Um, have you come across about these richer approaches towards uh, utilitarian uh, functions? Um, I can imagine that you can, so mathematically I can say maximize you subject to constraints. Mm -hmm. So I could easily set constraints which said that, oh, if the level of segregation falls or increases to this level, then you simply put it on as a constraint. And, and then, then basically you are constraining the space in which you are maximizing the utility. So you can definitely say consider diversity or segregation or you know affordability or sustainability or climate or whatever it is that you would want to incorporate as a constraint function and but but yeah i guess the question is is there also work that actually actively considers distributional aspects of that overall utility quantity into different socioeconomic sections of the population and then see how the distributions of the utility could be modeled as some sort of a constraint in the in the optimization model so to speak so yeah, I'm only I'm only imagining that. If yeah, yeah, the things like yeah, you, you you can as well like imagine that, and we can like conceptualize that. But yeah, I would say that most of the models are not considering this kind of like diversity into their assumptions. Uh, probably as well because we are lacking, uh, I don't know, part of the um, evidence of how much diversity is good or bad. This longitudinal study that you all were mentioning from Harvard probably is like going in that direction. It's like, okay, we would be able to quantify how actual diversity is affecting in the long term to quality of life, happiness, whatever you want to conceptualize that or measure that. Uh, so <laughs> probably as well is because we are missing that part of the, mm. of, the of the evidence. But mm. um, which, was this, which was this research going on on, on Harvard? Who was conducting that? Uh, yeah, I'll put it in the chat window. I think it's called equality of... Upper opportunity, is, isn't it? Raj Chetty, Raj Chetty, yeah. I think he's done uh, plenty of uh, work. There's a Harvard course that you can follow online as well. I think it's 20 hours of uh, lectures on inequality with this, yeah, um, data uh, that he got access to. It's a uh, taxes data, I think. Mm. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. It has been quite insightful. Uh, actually, yeah, I need to recover part of those references that you were mentioning on, on segregation. So yeah, thank you so much. And thank you all, because this was an experiment. This was not, you know, the usual set of results. I had lots of thoughts. Uh, this is part of one chapter in the book. And I hope this, you know, just discussing with Clementine. So th this was relatively um, not finished work that was being presented. So thank you for having the patience, you know, because, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I think uh, it's time for us and time probably for you to get into the evening, but uh, I'm really, really happy that you took the time uh, and that you presented this work in progress.
uh, to this seminar. So thank you again, Somrita. And for the next sessions, it's quite unsure uh, what's happening at the moment. What is sure is that there will be at least one more episode to the seminar, uh, at least one mm -hmm. with like a few of the previous speakers and trying to reflect on the series that we've had uh, over the past year. But for the July session, it's not so sure yet. So I can't say when uh, I might see you again on this seminar, but uh, I hope we'll see you again. Um, and yeah, for now, I want to uh, wish everyone a, a very fine day, a very fine evening to you, Samrita. And uh, yeah, I will see you soon. Bye. Thank you for Thanks all the for questions me. and talk Thank and much. discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.